Good evening. I'm Dr. Steve Finger, and we'd like to welcome you to another exciting episode of Libertarian TV Hard Fire. Uh, tonight, we're very fortunate to have with us as our guest, uh, Mr. Cameron Weber, who's written a book, a book on economics called Economics for Everyone. And uh, Cameron is very well qualified to have written a book like this. Cameron has a BA from Tulane, <coughs> an MBA from the University of New Mexico. Uh, he was a diplomat with the Foreign Service working in Africa and Central Asia. His last job was, was as a chief of financial oversight at the State Department, and he's currently studying economics at New York's New School for Social Research. Welcome, Cameron. Thank you for coming on our show this evening. Thank you, Steve. Now, first question I'd like to ask you is, a, a book is a big undertaking. Yeah. What made you decide to write this book? Uh, right. So the name the name of the book is uh, is economics for everyone, a and basically, <laughs> basically, if you ask somebody what is economics and they they say numbers, oh, I'm not interested in economics. It's numbers, and, and but economics is more than that. Economics affects everyone, day in day out. Economics describes. <clears throat> what is society? What is the role for government in society? These are questions that people have been asking ever since mankind organized itself. And I, I used to live in Washington, D.C., where everything is politics. People discuss politics all the time and get very passionate about certain issues without really under, understanding the underlying economics be, behind the, the issues. And so what I wanted to do, and, and a lot of economics and economists, it's, it's very arcane and hard to understand. And so what I wanted to do was write a book that anybody can read and anybody can understand so they can understand what is economics, how it affects people's lives. And I tried to make it as simple as possible. And that's why you call it economics for everyone. For everyone. For yeah. everyone. Because yeah. economics is not such an arcane study. Everybody has to know some economics. We have to use it in our day-to-day -day activities. Plus, we have to vote. And government right. has an increasingly large role in the government, in the economy, as we know. And we'd like to have a little understanding of what they're talking about so they can't always pull the wool over our eyes. Yeah. Um, okay. Now, getting right to your book, um, uh, Cameron, one of the most important things that people hear about is the law of supply and demand. We say it over and over again. It doesn't obey the law of supply and demand. It does. It doesn't. Some people think the law of supply and demand was passed by Congress, or some think that it was passed on a local level. But as we know, the law of supply and demand is actually a description of how the economy works. Yeah. And uh, it, I know you would agree that one of the most important things that you could tell your readers is what exactly is the law of supply and demand. So could yeah. you tell us exactly what the law of supply and demand is? Okay. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> right. Basically, all, yeah, not... Every economist, they say that if you, if you want three opinions, ask two, two economists. <laughs> but the law, the, uh, the law of supply and demand, basically in my book, what I try to do is capture things that most economists agree on, hmm. fundamental things that most economists would agree on. Not every economist is going to agree on everything in my book, but most people will agree with the content of the book. And... and and where there's items there that economists don't agree on or are still under debate, I, I notate it in there. But one of the, the fundamental things they teach you in economics is, is supply and demand. And so, right, what is supply and demand? So I'll, I'll try to make it as simple as possible. Uh, there's lots of mathematical formulas and all kinds of things that people use and economists use to, to prove this and they measure real things. But I, I, I'm just going to make it as, as simple and psychologically... <coughs> make it uh, simple, Ken. Make it simple. <laughs> so, so basically, supply and demand, this is a basic supply and demand graph. <laughs> here you have the quantity, here you have the price. And I'm using the car market because <clears throat> America has a lot of cars. <laughs> uh, so basically, psychologically and economically, when the price goes up, s someone who's selling something or supplying something is willing to supply more of it. Right? You go to a market, 
like you so said. What you're I, saying is actually the law of supply and demand describes our relationship between the price of a good and the supply available and the demand for the good yeah. and how they're all interrelated. Yes. When the, <clears throat> when, the, when the price goes up, you're willing to supply more. When the price goes down, you're willing to buy more. Supply and demand. And this can be f two individuals trading something. It could be a whole industry. It could be where the, the whole world's economy is at equilibrium. It's uh, aggregated supply and demand. But it basically, the underlying psychological basis for it is you're willing to sell more when the price goes up and you're willing to buy more when the price goes down. Right. And where they meet is what determines the quantity and so the price. So is that what economists refer to as the market clearing price? Yes. The price where everything is in balance? For any given market, in this case the car market, your market clearing price, in this case <clears> supply <throat> and demand, intersect at one million cars sold at twenty thousand dollars. That's where In other per, words, per for car. every for every object, for every object, there is a price at which the supply available mm -hmm. will meet mm -hmm. the demand the, the demand for that particular yeah. object. Yeah. And if you if you raise the price, if you raise the price, the demand goes down right. if you and the supply goes up yeah. and vice versa. Yeah, your, your original question was, is that the market clearing price? Yes. When, when people interact individually without any external intervention, you get a, uh, pe people acting voluntarily together without any external intervention, you'll have a market clearing supply and demand price. Yes. In other words, the supplier and the purchaser yeah. have, a, have a, a voluntary interaction. Right. Now, some people feel that, that when prices are too high, when prices are too high, the government has a role, right. and that the government can just at will right. have price controls. Now, you've right. just told us that there is, a, that there is a, a, an actual price at which there's no shortages and there's no surpluses. Yeah. What happens if the government gives us a price control? If the government feels that a loaf of bread should not cost more than a dollar, and, uh, right. and uh, when ordinarily it would cost two dollars, and the government gives us price controls, what do we get as a, re as a result of these price controls? Yeah. Well, right. So supply and demand describe what happens in a, in a, in a market, in a, people voluntarily reacting each, with each other. When you get, when you upset the supply or the demand curves through external intervention, you get a distortion in the quantity and the price. So, right. So basically, I've got a few examples that I'd like to show you. Okay. On. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, in so other words, what you're saying is, if you, if the government controls the price and makes it too low, yeah, then there'll be all the stuff that's there <laughs> will be sold. People, supplies won't want to supply enough, and there'll be a bigger demand, uh, and we'll have uh, right. shortages. Right. 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 Shortages. Right. In, in other words, if 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 the if the if there's a curtailment on what the supplier can get for their product, and they'll supply less. If there's a curtailment on the, the price, and the demander will want more. Yes. In other words, <laughs> what we're saying is, many people feel that if we have price controls, you can have everything that you have just the way it is now. Only it will be cheaper. Yeah. But what you're saying is that that isn't the case. What's yeah. going to happen if we have price controls? is you're not going to have what you have now. You can have lower prices, but you'll have shortages. Yes. So the government can't just set price controls like that. Now, did you have some examples yeah. that you wanted to give us? Yeah, yeah. So this, um, <clears throat> this is, uh, <coughs> I'm using the car market to, out, to outline these general principles. <clears throat> and then we'll get into specific real-life government interventions th that, that happen. Um, OK. So basically, before we had one million cars sold at twenty thousand dollars per car. Now, the, in this example, the car market with a price ceiling, meaning that the price for a car cannot rise above ten thousand dollars. This means that people will demand more. They'll demand one point five million cars, yet the supplier will only supply. A half a million cars. So basically, there'll be 1.5 million demanded, <clears throat> a half a million supplied, and you'll have a, a shortage of a million cars. In other words, if people feel that the cars are too expensive and they want a $20,000 right. car for $10,000, it can't happen. 
because if the government puts yeah. on a price control, yeah. the price will be lower, but the cars won't be there. So you can right. have a non-existent car at a lower price. Yeah, well, one of the things I mentioned in my book is economics is, is based on, uh, the type of economics I'm talking about in my book is based on goods being scarce. There's not enough of anything to go around, so there needs to be a mechanism to control or a, me a mechanism to coordinate, a naturally coordinating mechanism, and that is the pricing and that supply and demand. And so what, what you have prior, you had one million cars sold, right? Now you're only selling a half a million cars, so you have a loss to society of you not only have a, an excess demand or a shortage, but you actually have a loss to society because a half a million less cars are being sold, right. which has repercussions in employment and, and... And this is important for people to understand because we often hear people, hear politicians talking about price controls, price controls, as though you can have the same, same goods, the same food, the same housing, the same clothing that you have now at a cheaper price, but what you're telling us is that according to the basic fundamental laws of economics, it's not possible. Can fool Mother Nature. That you, uh, if, you low, if you have an artificially lowered price, right. all it means is that we're just not going to have enough goods to go around. In, in the short term, it's, 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 <laughs> in the, it's, a, it's, a, it's a short term fix with long term repercussions. And yeah. we have examples of that right here in New York. We have rent controls, which is a form yeah. of price control. Yeah, yeah, well, yes, we do. Uh, I actually have a specific example on on rent control. Well, let's let's see. Yeah. Um, okay. <clears throat> oh, <laughs> look at that. <laughs> so uh, right, I, I just moved to New York a, a a year ago, so I have personal experience with this. But, uh, okay, prior to rent control, in this example, there would be, in the market clearing supply and demand, without any mm -hmm. intervention in the market, you would have 100,000 apartments rented at $1,500 a month. When you have an artificial cap on the price, say of one thousand dollars per month instead of at a at a thousand per month you'll have fifty thousand units supplied and you'll have a hundred and fifty thousand units demanded or a shortage of a hundred and fifty thousand units and you'll have a, a net loss to society of fifty thousand units so where do people live they have to live farther from where the rent control units are. So it's, it's not just, uh, th there's, these types of interventions have repercussions throughout uh, an economics system. Right. And as we know, this is, this is a real example. Many people don't realize that before World War II, before there were rent controls, landlords actually would compete for tenants. They used to offer them a, free, uh, a month or two free rent. They would offer them extra appliances to get tenants. And now, of course, nobody believes anything like that because rent control, rent control, as Cameron has shown us, has given us such a shortage of apartments that people uh, go to great lengths to get a decent apartment yeah. when it used to be the other way around. So what the rent controls have done is made cheaper rent for many people, but at the expense of having enough rents around, enough rent, enough uh, apartments around. Right, There's right. A shortage it, of apartments. Yeah, what it does to, like, so <laughs> many so many things, it helps uh, a select, it helps those that have the apartments and it hurts everyone else. Right. Are there other examples that you, that you, that come to mind when we talk about price controls, Colin? Um, yeah, but basically I've got, uh, uh, let's see what's next. Uh, I, I had a, okay, um, price, Okay. Uh, the electric Remember we talked about electricity yeah. controls because many people say that electricity is too expensive and we should just just pass right. a law making electricity right. cheaper. Right. And we know when that happens, all that all that we get is we get less electricity, brownouts, blackouts. Right, right. Some some things are viewed as very socially necessary. And I know you want me to tell this story, so I'm going to tell it. Is when I was in in uh, Tashkent, Uzbekistan about 5 seven years after the Soviet Union fell and there wasn't any more price controls. 
so people were getting enough to eat and things like that. But for some reason, the uh, uh, the government of Uzbekistan <laughs> decided that they were going to make sugar available to everyone at a reduced price, maybe for political reasons, or uh, which usually is the case. But so they lowered the price of sugar to a certain amount, and and there was a within ten minutes all the sugar in in Tashkent was gone, and there wasn't any more sugar. So the people that get that got the sugar it was great, but the, but there was nobody willing to supply any more sugar. So those that didn't have it were, were so the law of supply and demand. Price was, controls worked. Right, right. they and didn't so, work to control prices. Right. they worked to control to make a shortage. Yeah. So right. So. Government or politics or society in that case prioritize sugar for their for their tea. Electri electricity is also considered a, a fundamental societal good, <coughs> which therefore <coughs> deems uh, necessary for so, government intervention. So what intervention. you're basically saying is that uh, price controls create shortages. Uh, uh, yeah. They don't make things cheaper. They just give us <laughs> shortages. <laughs> what's left may be cheaper, but we have basically. Shortages. Well, we, we saw we saw that in California, what two or three years ago, where there was the the brownouts and the blackouts and absolute right. shortages, and people say deregulate it was due to deregulation or or not or or whatever. But it's it's re basically what I try to do with my book mm -hmm. and what economics is 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 reasoning. It's reasoning and it's understanding logic. And basically, yes, if if you curtail the price of something by putting a, a, a limit on it, there'll be less supplied and more demanded, creating a shortage. And and here, and no one will supply more. I mean, they, they, they sign long-term long contracts for certain amounts, and then when the price is capped... Because if it's cap, cheaper, the suppliers don't want to supply. Exactly. And the demand and demand is elastic. That means if you make it cheaper, <laughs> people want it, they're just going to use more of it. The, the right. electricity is cheaper. Right. They leave the air conditioner on all the time. Leave the lights on all the well, time. Well, and in and, and electricity, it's it's <clears throat> really bad because you know people get stuck in elevators. You know th things like that. And so the way I've drawn this one is you actually have a, a instead of the difference between s the quantity demanded at the ceiling price and the supply at the ceiling price, you actually have a shortage from where it was. So this is actual electrical shortages, not, so not, not shortages. just a, actual shortages, actual not just... Out some not but just, let me ask uh, you something along the same lines, Cameron. If price controls produce shortages, what about an example where you make the prices artificially higher? Like agriculture, whoops, yeah. like agriculture, yeah. where we have price supports, right. where the government gives farmers extra money Right. For for yeah. uh, for producing their products, what what right. what is the effect of price supports? Just just like elect electricity is is a politically sensitive area, so is is uh, agriculture for for whatever reason to keep people from immigrating, to allow old fashioned lifestyles to propagate fear of change. I, I don't know, but for whatever reason, the United States. And in Europe, of course, have well, most countries prioritize agriculture sectors for one reason or another. And in the United States, what we do is is we um, we make yes. charts. <laughs> That's what economists do, yeah. Uh, the market for corn with price supports. So. What we do is we subsidize our agriculture sector in many different ways. So uh, how much is it, 500 billion a year, something like that? We keep trying to negotiate and it keeps going up. It, it's, it's special interest in politics. they pay farmers <laughs> extra money. The farmers yeah. get a certain price for a bushel so, corn. Right. So, so in this case, extra money. So in this case, the market for, for corn <clears> with <throat> price, without, surprise, without price supports, you'd have one million bushels of corn selling at five dollars a bushel. Now, what the government wants to do in order to keep farms in business, instead of allowing a market clearing supply and demand, they pay farmers extra money to grow to, more. To grow more. Or and to not they, grow in certain cases. Yeah. And when they pay farmers more money to grow more, 
Right. What do the farmers do? Exactly. So what happens is you have a the supply. Of, grow more. You have a supply <clears throat> of 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 a of a half a million more bushels a year than would have been demanded before. So what do you do with a half a million extra bushels of corn? You you well. Or or cheese, well, cheese or milks or whatever it is. There's there's Cameron from your experience in the foreign foreign service. Yeah, you've seen what happens to the surplus because there's right. the government is paying the farmers to grow more than consumers in this country right. want. So they have extra. What do they do with this extra stuff? Okay, so yes, part of our foreign assistance program to developing countries is taking our excess agriculture produce, which we the taxpayers have paid for. Fine. You know, again, it has repercussions. There's farmland unneeded in the United States that could what do they be put do to with better all this use. Extra, what do they do with all the extra yeah. farm supplies? So, we, so we take all of this excess agriculture produce, and then we either give it away or sell it at reduced prices to our to the developing world. What's and called how, the how developing does that world. affect the farmers in the right. developing world? So, it helps <clears> our. So it de it destroys their supply and demand relationship for their agriculture produce and country, and so you have so many farmers in in Africa, in the poorer parts of Latin America, and the poorer parts of the ex-Soviet Union, who live at subs subsistence agriculture levels because they can't sell their goods because mm -hmm. the the rich West is dumping their agricultural pro pro products on the developing world. We see another example of how. The law of supply and demand comes in and, yes. and affects our decisions. We think that we're just going to give the farmers a little bit more money at no cost, <laughs> but not only do the taxpayers have to pay, but we're actually hurting farmers in developing countries, then we have to give them more aid over there. So it's, <laughs> it's really self-defeating. Yes. Okay. Yeah, the, an economic system is, has repercussions throughout. Right. Well, I'm, there are many other examples. I mean, we talked before, I think you mentioned something about the effect of the laws of supply and demand on the drug wars, drug uh, wars yeah. which are very important in this country. I mean, drugs ordinarily, without yeah. any, any government intervention, uh, most narcotics would be very, very inexpensive. <laughs> but we see what happens when the government gets involved in that. <laughs> right, yeah. Th that's probably one of the most insidious things that, that we do. Uh, creating a criminal class, creating an underclass in the urban youth in, in the United States, creating hatred uh, for our, inter our military interventions abroad, for taking away subsist subsistence farmers' ways of making a living in, in Latin America and in Asia by our drug war. I mean, alcohol is legal, tobacco is legal. For some reason, marijuana is not. Mm -hmm. For some reason, uh, narcotics are not. And by, by curtailing the supply with all these laws, what effect does it have on the price of the drugs? Okay. So what... <laughs> In other words, you're saying the law of supply and demand is, is, is uh, there's an interaction between price and supply and yeah. demand. Yeah. When, they, when, when we curtail the supply by making it illegal, the price goes up. Yes. What, what happened... Okay, again, I'll use the economist graph to show, to show here. Before, and I didn't put any specific examples, <clears throat> because, uh, but basically you would have one supply and demand market clearing level, right? So what happens when the government steps in and arrests and curtails supplier, supply, supply and what happens to the price? It kicks back the supply curve, which then raises the price. And so what happens... So artificially curtailing the yeah. supply right. raises the price. Those unlucky enough to get caught or who aren't, politi who aren't connected enough not to get caught, the only the, the most violent survive, the most that have the most no, egregious we pass a law, violent international If we pass networks. a law against drugs, we don't just stop drugs. It has, because of the laws of economics, by making it more difficult to get drugs, the prices go up. And yeah, it right. It raises right. the prices, yeah. and that leads to more crime. <laughs> right, and so those who are truly addicted have to pay more and have even a worse cycle to try to right. get so out. So we have another example of government intervention. Right, that, but but so right, what happens is the higher price then allows more profit for those still in the business. So the government, the drug war, make, makes more money for those selling drugs. Right, illegally. and this is a direct result of government. 
intervention uh, right. and, and the effects of the laws of supply and demand. But I, I know that you believe that there are some instances in which the government does have a role. Uh, wait, wait, Steve. But before that, a lot of people say in the drug war, oh, but it does cut back the quantity sold. Mm. The drug war does cut, cut back the quantity sold. What I, what I wanted to show is that if this demand was slanted this way, in other words, if, <clears throat> if the demand was not price dependent, mm. in other words, if those who wanted drugs were, would pay for them no matter what the price or due to addiction, I mean, alcohol is, is what, taxed it. 200 mm percent. -hmm. It's the, the largest. Prior to the income tax, it was the way the federal government got its revenue. So it's, there's inelastic demand. If, the, if this demand curve was like that, the quantity wouldn't change, only the profit for the, those still in, in the business. Right. So we see another example of why it's important for individuals to understand economics because it yeah. affects everything, it have, even yes. drugs. But I, I think you felt that there were some areas where the government does have a role. I think you mentioned something about yeah. market failure. Right. Was there? Would you like to explain to our, our viewers yeah. what exactly you mean by market failure where the government should have some role? In my book, uh, I think you mentioned something about pollution. Yeah. You said something, I, I, covered I read some, your book, was very interesting. Yeah, you said yeah, yeah. something to the effect that where um, we're, we're products yeah. produce pollution, yeah. that the government has a role because the price is not really right. completely right. completely right. covered in the, yeah, in the yeah. good. Yeah, chapter five okay. of my book is called The Economic Role for Government. Okay, unfortunately, we've come to a close of a very exciting episode oh, okay. with Cameron Weber, who's written a book called Economics for Everyone which is not in the bookstores yet, but can be purchased right. online at uh, Cameron. I couldn't find it. Camera for Economics. Cam Cameron Economics. Cameron Economics. Dot com. Cameron Economics. Dot com. And we see how important it is to understand economics in all aspects of our lives. Thank you for coming to another, for listening to another episode of Hot Fire TV. And we hope you'll join us again next week. Hard Fire is funded in part by the Libertarian Party of New York. Catering for the cast and crew of Hard Fire is generously provided by Da Vincenzo Restaurant, 256 Prospect Park West, Brooklyn, New York, 11215, 718-369-3590, www.davincenzorestaurant.com.